everybody, I'm David Bach. I want to welcome you back to the David Bach Show. This is a really special edition because I'm interviewing my truly dear friend here, Michaela Kopecki. Um, buddy, it's good to, first of all, good to officially have you in the house, like, because actually we are in my house. I've never recorded a podcast in my home before. But you and I have become, like, best friends in Florence. It is, it, it is a honor to be here, of course, <laughs> and be here for, in many occasions, Many nice occasions, of, of course, here with you, with your family, with our friends. But being here to for being interviewed by, by David Bach, I mean, so, it's a great thing. So what, the reason I'm interviewing Michele today is that I'm going to go back a little bit in time here. Michele was the attorney that my wife, Alicia, found back in 2018. I'm going to take you back in history a little bit here. So in 2018, I am working on a book called, got it right here, just do a little plug, The Latte Factor. And in this book, the main character, Zoe Daniels, was going to take a radical sabbatical. And I decided that I wanted my family to take a radical sabbatical. And the idea was we would move to Italy for my son Jack's sophomore year. And so we started the process. And she did the due diligence of finding you. And in the middle of then my book tour, I get this message saying, okay, I'm about to wire money to this man <laughs> to help us move to Florence can you look at his website? So I said, wait, how much money are we wearing him? And who, and who is he? And I go to your website, and very professional website, and I start Googling about you. And the first thing I come across is an interview in the CBS early show, which I had been on that show a bunch of times. So I watched the full interview. I'm in the Kansas City airport, and I'm super impressed. And then I Google you more, and I come across all the articles in the Florentine that you had done. And so I start reading, the, which is my favorite go-to publication to move to Florence, in which I now write for, and this will actually go in the Florentine also uh, as an interview. And so we hire you, and that's where the story begins, and that's kind of what I want to start with, because um, you help people like myself who want to move to Italy come here for longer than just being a tourist. So, so let's, let's start with that. And again, you've been doing this, just some quick bio on Michele. Michele has been doing this for over 20 years and you are known as not only the most handsome attorney in all of Florence, he's, he's always dressed immaculately like he is right now, but you're also known as the AKA Italian Legal Whisperer. You just launched a brand new podcast answering all the questions that expats have. You have a column in the Florentine. Um, you're the guy that everybody comes to. Everybody I know in Florence all of our friends have pretty much hired you for everything related to moving here, real estate, opening a business, taxes, every question that someone can have who is an expat, they come to you for. And so everyone comes to me, I get emails, I get you know, posts on social media, and they ask me all these questions, and I can't answer any of them, I just say, go to Michaela. So today I'm gonna to ask you all the questions. Here we are. Well, it's, um, you know, <clears throat> sometimes it is, it's business that finds you. I started as traditional civil law lawyer. I graduated from, from law school here in Florence and then I started practicing here in a traditional law firm. But then at some point over time, you realize that the international community of Florence is big. So you start working in English for clients that have specific problems and then word of mouth gets more and more uh, something where you can help more people. At some point, I decided I want to have a, an international master to have a more round understanding of some issues that sometimes happen in, in business, especially. And I came back, I went to spend some time in China, spent some time in New York, I decided to bring back my, my business here. And that is when we started working with, with the Florentine, and that gives even more exposure to what we do. And, you know, a little bit of word of mouth, a little bit of publication, of course, the things that we, we do on, on our social media it became more and more a thing to, to just focus, focus my legal practice in, on helping people to bring their life, business and family in Italy. And this is what we are, we've been doing for the majority of the past 10, 10, 15 of the 20 years of practice I had was just focus on, on this. Reacquiring Italian citizenship is one of the big subjects nowadays that obtaining Italian citizenship means get European Union passport. Italy is one of the most uh, generous country in Europe in terms of allowing people to reacquire their Italian citizenship. So we are working on a lot of things, 99% of the time working with foreigners who are trying to do either buy the property, as you said, 
running investment or simply take, taking a sabbatical and bringing their family as you did here so, in Italy. And, and we're going to cover also this idea of getting Italian citizenship because you said there's 20 million Americans who could reclaim their Italian I, citizenship. But I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't, yes, I don't want to start there. I want to, I want to get to that later because I want to kind of do this step by step. Mm -hmm. So when someone wants to come to Florence mm -hmm. or for that matter anywhere in Italy as a tourist, they can for up to 90 days. Correct. When someone like myself wants to come for longer than 90 days, what needs to happen? Walk, walk everybody through the process, because it's not a simple process. I start with what not to do. Okay. <laughs> Which is, don't make the assumption that if you come as a tourist, so you come without a visa, if you're American, you don't need a visa, so you arrive with your passport, you bring your things, well, you, you, you can take some time to be here in Italy. And all of a sudden, when you're in Italy, you decide you want to stay longer. Which happens all the time. All the time. Yeah. I Especially will, in Florence. And you start with this misleading information that sometimes people come to us and say, listen, I heard that I'm here as a tourist, but if I go to the immigration office, to the questor, if I sign some document, I can extend for another 90 days my stay. So, no, you can't. Unless there is a medical emergency or real emergency, you cannot extend your 90 days. After 90 days out of 180 days, you have to leave the country. Period. There are no, not only leave the country, but leave, get out of European Union. Some people think you that, have well... To, you have to leave the EU. You, you, you can't just go from Italy to Germany for 90 days and then back to Italy. No, you have to get out of European Union. And you cannot even go to England or another outside of, like, bordering countries outside the European Union because it's outside and stay there for a week or so and then thinking that you are recharging your clock for another 90 days. People think, well, if I go there for a week and I come back, do I recharge my 90 days? Like, no, you have to be out for 90 days if you spend 90 days continuously in Italy. What, what happens to the tourist that comes here and all of a sudden they're here 100 days? If they stay longer than 90 they days? They stay longer than 90 days. They might have, and it, it happened more and more, uh, problems when they are leaving the Schengen zone because nowadays... When they're exiting. Exiting, the air, Exiting yeah. at the airport. At the airport, and they're leaving at customs, European Union customs, Depending on the state, the border where you, where you are, each nation, so uh, France, Germany, Holland, they have different border rules, bordering rules when you're leaving. But you need to give back your passport. They check how long you've been in Europe. Now everything is digitized, everything is electronic. They see exactly how many days you've been in, in Europe. You don't fool them around, right. change your passport and some, stuff like that. And it comes out, if it comes out that you've been there more than the 90 days you had, you can face consequences mainly in terms of your ability to come back later on because very often you're put in blacklist or um, basically list of people where you are you haven't respected the rules you can be banned for amount of you may lose your visa waiver status which is the status of someone who can come without a visa we had people that were bounced back next time they were trying to come arrive at the airport wow. in in, uh, in the Netherlands arriving from America and they said you you last time you were here you said 120 days you overstayed you cannot come go back to your country and get a visa I, I also know people have been pulled over and they were here longer than they were supposed to be yeah. and they were basically told you have three days to leave the country um, yeah. okay so I now know I want to come like David longer than three months what does someone need to do in order to get like I always refer to it as a tourist visa, but what's the technical term? Somebody wants to move here like I did for a year, because we were originally going to come for nine months, and, uh, and then we'll talk about how I ended up staying longer, but how do I do what, how do other people do what I did? Italy provides a kind of extensive list of visa scheme, like different kind of visa you can request through the Italian consulate in your home country to stay lo in Italy longer than 90 days. So if you want to stay as a tourist, there are no exceptions. There doesn't exist a visa for tourists who want to stay in Italy more than 90 days. Tourism is something you do on a, uh, in a short-term basis for 90 days, no more than that. If you want to stay in Italy more than 90 days, it is assumed by our authorities that you're doing for a purpose that is not mere tourism. So it can be to come to study, it can be to bring your business, to set up a company, to run an investment, to take a sabbatical year. Taking a sabbatical year is a possibility that people that don't need to acti actively be involved in a business activity 
can can use to come here. There is a visa for people that old you know old time or was considered a retiring visa. Now it is a visa that anybody who can prove to have a passive income, meaning an income that they're receiving periodically on their bank account that doesn't require an active activity. So not working, clocking in, clocking out every day. Right. Um, if you're receiving through rent, pension, dividend of your business money that allows you to stay in Italy without working, you are eligible for a visa that you can use to take an extended uh, time in, your, in, in Italy. So it depends a little bit on what is the purpose for which you are, you are coming. And we have at the beginning of every interview with our clients when they reach out to us saying, I want to live in Italy, what are my options? <laughs> this is a big subject. We, we, uh, we suggest them to uh, book an appointment with us. We have online meeting with them. We have a preliminary assessment of their case. We try to understand if they come alone, if they come for business, if they want to buy a property, if you already purchase a property. One interesting subject that happens very often is going back to what not to do <coughs> when you're coming as a tourist. People are sometimes receiving wrong information as I said, I know that I can buy a house as a tourist. And if I buy a house, that house becomes my residency and I can remain in that in Italy because I own a house, because I purchase a house. And it's not true. It's not true. I've seen people in, in bowling in, in tears because nobody told them that buying a property in, in Italy doesn't give you a qualification to, to remain in, in Italy. We don't have a, a property visa, let's say, or a visa that is based on if I buy a house, I can stay in Italy. <clears throat> that doesn't exist. So you can buy a house as a tourist, but that doesn't give you any privilege or any authorization to stay here. You still need to go back in your own country to get a visa from the Italian consulate. Okay, so I know that people do this themselves, but I don't know how they do it themselves, which is why we hired you, because the process of going to the consulate to bring just our documents to them was, was literally, if, nobody, you know, if you're listening to the podcast, you can't see this, but I'm putting my hands up on this video. Like it was a, a binder that was about four inches thick of every single imaginable document. I've, it, it, it was harder than anything I've actually ever done. It, it was more than applying to college. Yeah. Um, and, and then if you get anything wrong, you're not getting your visa, including like you have to have your documents translated for Italian. Um, so how, why, how do people do this themselves and why is it so important to actually hire an attorney to get it done correctly? Uh, well, we, we have the example sometimes, like when we, we, we talk about these kind of things in, in, with some people, like you can remodel your house by yourself. There are people that are very skilled people that can repaint, fix their, their bathroom and kitchen all by themselves. Yeah. Good for them, <laughs> not one of those people. So I, I, uh, I realized the few times that I tried to fix something in my house by myself that it cost me more money than to hire someone a plumber, an electrician, or whoever, to fix what I did wrong rather than calling them in the first place. And I think that a lot of people are realizing it because a lot of people come to us after having attempted to do a lot of these things, including buying a property or moving to Italy. We have a client recently that came to us saying, it's all done. It's all done, Michele. I already, I already put down the deposit. We were ready to go. We are going to visit for the final inspection of the house and we're ready to go. Three days later, I said, and I told him, of course, good for you. Let me know if you need anything. The purchasing of a house was one of the elements that we needed for his citizenship application. So it was coming to us to tell us that he didn't to rent the place because he was already working on buying a property. Three days later, it again, urgent, like, so you know, see the email urgent. with urgent in the <laughs> subject, call me back as soon as you can. I said, what's up? And we're having a problem with the, pro with the property. They made us sign a document that uh, told us we could get out of the investment anytime. It's actually not true. The realtor now wants to be paid, but we don't like the property. What are our options? I said, I, I don't know what to tell you. Like, it depends on what kind of document they made you sign at the beginning and what kind of uh, right you, 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 kept for, you kept for yourself in case you want to get out of a business or outside of the investment. So. Um, there are people that are more savvy than others and probably they're able to handle this kind of business by themselves. But in my opinion, given that most of the time it's one shot, one kill, meaning if you don't, if you don't bring the right document to the consulate the first time, 
if you apply for the wrong type of visa, the chances then, then you can amend your application or start from scratch or convince the Italian consulate, actually, you're not coming to study but to make an investment. How, what's likely that they will believe in your different story you're presenting? Or, so, also, in my, also in my opinion, like in it's not a good idea to, to change your route when you're there. So it's better to start with the right foot when you, are, uh, uh, when you still do it. You can still do it. Uh, one thing that you just said, and I want to make sure everybody catches this, is that when you go through the process of the consulate, first of all, it takes months to get a date. So it, I think it took us three months to get a date in New York. If we had done something wrong in that appointment, we had to get back in a queue for 60 to 90 days. You don't always get invited right back. So mm -hmm. one other thing I've, have, I've tried to tell people is the process of moving here is something that you plan far in advance. Like we, we worked on the plan for over a year. I know some people try to do this last minute. What do you think the time frame is? If someone's <coughs> listening to this and they want to move to Italy, how, what is the horizon that you tell someone who calls you? Um, if at the end of the meeting, the preliminary meeting we have, we decide, we, we can determine what's the roadmap, what's the best way to get here, we tell our clients to book immediately an appointment with the consulate because, again, it can take easily three months to, to have an appointment. And I think, generally speaking, for the majority of the situation, cases, three months is a good time um, for us, like, as a legal advisor, <coughs> to collect the documentation that we need to have for the majority of a visa application. So for a work visa, for an investment visa, for family reunion under some circumstances, circumstances for a study visa, for uh, elective residency visa, these are all visas that in three months of work, two, three months of work together, we should be able to have all the documentation ready. It's a little more peculiar, <clears throat> for instance, when some documents need to be collected by the applicant in the United States. For instance, if you're coming as a family, you need to bring your birth, the, the, your marriage certificate and the birth certificate of your kids. And they cannot just be uh, photocopies you or copies. The it must be the original and must be apostille. Apostille is a process of uh, basically obtaining a certificate issued by the, the Department of State or Secretary of State of the state where the document was issued. That can take some time. So it's a, a way to legalize, let's say, the document in order to be used abroad. So if you come to me with a copy of your birth certificate or the birth certificate of your children, expecting it to be accept used by the Italian consulate, it's very likely they will not like it. So that is where we say, let's start working together now in order to be ready in two, three months period for your application at the Italian consulate. I'm very lucky because you know <coughs> my wife, Alicia, she's extremely organized. And so God bless her, she organized all those documents yep. for us. So once we, the day we move here, we, we get the visa, we move here, and I'm walking people through this so they know what it's like. When you, if you, everything goes right and you get the visa done, and then you <clears throat> land in Italy, there's a process that you have to go through, I think it's within three days, right? Eight days. Eight days, okay. So I know people don't always know this, right? They get their visa, they land here, and they don't know what they have to do in the first eight days, which can get them in huge trouble. Talk about what it is you have to do within the first eight days of moving here. Thinking that if you got an Italian visa, the visa from the Italian consulate, you're done, is a big mistake, big, big misconception. You need to, within eight days from when you arrive, you need to, most of the time, go to the post office, get a kit, which is a basic, a big envelope that contains a bunch of forms that need to be filled out, and you need to submit those forms together with basically a copy of the same document you used at the Italian consulate to apply for your permit to stay, permesso di soggiorno. The ta the, there is a big, big misunderstanding sometimes. You, you talk about, I got a visa, I renewed my visa. Actually, a visa is a sticker that is attached on your passport and is provided by the Italian consulate. And it's a document that throughout the first year allows you to go back and forth between Italy and the other countries. But the actual document that make you, makes you a legal and person living in, in Italy is your permit to stay. So don't thinking that with your visa you're fine, you can travel around and you're fine also from an immigration point of view here in Italy is a, a wrong misconception. You need to have apply you need to apply within eight days for the permit to stay. The permit to stay at the end of the day is a kind of a plastic card that seems like your driving license. The, the package that you got from a post office that you filled out with all your information will be mailed 
by the postal service to the immigration office of the place where you will be living. They will give you an appointment two or three months later for fingerprints, for reviewing your documentation, and another couple of months later, you will have your permit to stay card. That is the actual document that makes you legal in Italy. That's the that permesso. Is, that's the permesso di soggiorno. It's the document that annually, if you decide to stay here, you will renew. The visa will be gone, you will forget about it, you will renew your passport. You don't have to worry anymore about the visa. The permit to stay is a document that periodically, annually or every two years, depending on the case, um, you will renew through the, through the immigration office. So I, I want to tell a quick story about that experience that we went through with you because it, it's like such a favorite memory of mine. We show up in Italy, show up in Florence, it's July, it's record heat. I think it was like 105 degrees. I am in shorts. I think I was wearing sandals, a t-shirt, dripping in sweat, a baseball hat. I look like the classic American. <laughs> I show up in your office. You look exactly like you are right now. He's, for those you can't see him, he's like immaculately dressed. He's in a suit and tie. There's not one bit of sweat on him. And then you very handsomely take us to the, go through the process. Yep. And I don't know that you'll, if you remember this, but you said to me on the way out the door, you really should start thinking about what you're going to want to do at the end of nine months because you're probably going to want to stay. The nine, you said to me, the nine months that you've planned are going to go by so fast, so fast that you're going to blink your eyes and you're going to be leaving it and you're not going to want to leave. And I remember like it was yesterday, Michaela, I'm walking out of your office and I, I literally look at Alicia, I'm like, what is he talking about? Nine <laughs> months? I'm about to take a radical sabbatical for nine months. He's telling me it's going to go by like that and I'm going to stay. And I thought to myself, he's crazy. And that's exactly four years later. <laughs> four years later, that's exactly what happened. Um, is that common? Do people like come here like myself and just fall in love with it and don't and then stay? Like they, I mean, the government had to allow us to stay, but like that they do what we're doing. It's very common. Like uh, people facing ex exactly the same experience you had. People coming here with the intention of coming for one year for a sabbatical year, and then r realizing that the standard, the, the quality of life that quality we can life. have we can have here is still considered, with all the, the flaws and all the defects that Italy, Italians can have, but it's still in a great place where uh, raising your kids, where setting up your family, where set up your business, because at the end yeah. of the day, we're still one of the G7 countries. I mean, Italy is not like a third world country where having the, our government has set up a very interesting incentive uh, for new investors. So at the end of the day, it's becoming more and more common for people to come here just to try, then they like it. And if we have done things the right way, starting from day one, when they arrive with the right visa, with the right approach to, to their staying here in Italy, most of the time we're able to keep them here and let them do what you're doing, which is keep on living here your, your, your Italian dream. Well, and, and, and you know, continue to give you some pats on the back here, but credit for the life we have. You helped us with the process of finding an apartment, doing the lease, opening the Italian bank, bank account, because all those things were needed. I, ha I had to go get an Italian bank account. The lease that we did for our apartment was an eight year lease. They call it a four by four. four. And I thought that was insane. I was like, why, why are we doing and, and you said, you know, that's standard and it really protects you because you can get out of it after a year, but now you've got eight years. It's the best thing we ever did because now the rents have skyrocketed yeah. since 2019 and we are locked uh. in. and. I'm super grateful that we did all those things, got the Italian bank account, got the Italian credit card, did the lease. Um, so let, let's transition to real estate because um, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in now, now that we're staying, I'm interested in investing in real estate. A lot of people are in, interested in investing in real estate here in Florence, especially. That's the great news. Um, <laughs> Why don't you walk us through that process? Because I, I read an article uh, a week ago that more Americans are looking to move abroad for retirement and just in general than ever before. Um, and so how does somebody come and buy real estate? Let's just start there. How do you, how do you buy real estate in Italy? What's the process? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very different from the process you have in America. A lot of people, again, come to me, sometimes investor construction company from America or investor, real estate investor from America saying, we've done it all over the world. We know what to do. We know the business. Just, <laughs> we need just hint for the Italian uh, real estate market. I said, okay, great. So we have, again, our meeting for an hour online. And most of the time I said, 
oh, we didn't expect it to be so different from what we, we do in America. Um, there are some, I, I, I point out some of the things that uh, strike me the most when I talk about these kind of things with, with Americans. First of all, the role, the, the players in these real estate transactions, starting from the notary. The notary is this professional um, uh, public officer appointed by the government that you have a notary is in America, but in America, a notary is simply the person that certify your signature. Mm -hmm. Here is a public officer that sounds more something between a lawyer and a judge that is appointed to certify the legality of every single document that, that we're executing in order to complete the transaction and is actually the officer that determined the transfer of the title of possession from the seller to the buyer. So the notary is a key player and people understand why do I have to pay so much money for the notary. First of all, the notary collects also the taxes that you have to pay when you buy a property. But in general, is one of the most important player in a real estate transaction. And people sometimes don't really understand who is this person, where we have to sign, who reads 20 to 30 pages long contract for the purchase of a property. In addition, the, the role of the realtor is very different. Realtor in Italy, generally speaking, are uh, professional people that must be certified through uh, registration in the Chamber of Commerce that are the liaison between the seller and the buyer and therefore they get their commission from the seller and the buyer. A lot of Americans come to say, why am I paying they get, the they, realtor? They, they get a commission on both sides. Both sides. Okay, exactly. so I hire a real estate agent. Does that real estate agent represent me? No, they that's the thing. Okay, so what, talk about that. They represent who? They represent the seller. They, 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 they represent an inter intermediary subject they don't that represent help. either exactly that is there they represent in the sense that if i if i'm looking for a property and i go in a real estate agent or I get online and find a real real estate agent i tell the person that person i'm looking for a property having this characteristic first of all you can you can use five agencies five realtor is not an exclusive mandate most of the time some agencies expect to give ex exclusivity but generally speaking you can browse around looking for property using different agent and the first one who provides you put you in contact with the seller who has the right property is the agent that will be receiving the commission from you and from the seller are, are there also two agents in a deal like it depends like Sometimes. someone's listing the property yeah. and then you and then you found a different agent correct um, it's possible to have if the if generally speaking each agency has its portfolio of clients who are selling mm -hmm. so the first thing that an agent tried to do is like i had listed in my portfolio 20 properties and i'm going to try and show you, can you try, exactly um, in this case the properties that are sold by that agent are properties where the agent get the commission from the seller and the, from the buyer sometimes the, the place where you go doesn't have in its portfolio the property you're looking for but there is another agent, a friend, a colleague that maybe have sure. other properties. So, so the agents, the two agents talk to each other and say, listen, I have a buyer, you have a seller, can we work together? In this case, each person buy, pays his own agent. agent What's the typical do. commission? Oh, it depends. Um, we don't have, um, it's something that goes from two, three, generally speaking now, 4% of the final price of a property. Of both sides? Or each side. So it's not just two, three, four percent, it's that times two. Am I understanding it, that right? It could be six, it, seven, eight percent. Yeah, but you you <laughs> each each party pays three, right. four percent. Okay. So if you are one agent who is receiving commission from both the parties, you might even you know, the agent can charge the generally speaking charge the sell a little less than the buyer because the buyer is more um, has more things to take into consideration. So the, the, the relationship between the agents and the real estate agent and the seller and the buyer is something that is negotiated with their own personal agreement and contract. So it depends. But generally speaking, if the agent is the one, that the agent where you go is the one that provides you the property that you like, you have to pay that agent. Okay, so now talk about the financing. When someone comes here and they buy property, because in America, it's common to put, let's say, 10, 20% down mm -hmm. and finance the rest. I don't think it's quite the same here. How much money do people typically put down on property? When you talk about put down, is the deposit that is needed to be paid or put in an escrow account of the notary, again, in order to protect 
or to put the property outside of a market for the time that you're taking yeah. your due diligence or reviewing That's the step one. The step one. Um, when you're talking about financing, if you mean having access to financing like through a bank, like getting a mortgage to buy a property, is very unlikely. It's not very easy. Really? To get mortgage from an Italian bank for a property you want to buy if you are not permanently living in Italy and if your income is not arriving in Italy. In other words, if you're coming as a tourist, you can buy a property, but I can tell you in 20 years of activity, I, I found only one or twice a bank that was willing to give a mortgage okay. to a foreigner who is not generating any, any income in Italy. <coughs> in Italy. And I'm explaining to you why. The banking system is based on, obviously, um, they don't want to uh, get in a default situation where the, the, the buyer is not able to pay back the mortgage. The property itself in Italy, very, in very few occasions, represent the only collateral that the bank wants to have. Because in Italy it's very hard to sell back the property to evict the, whoever is in the property and get the property back, putting back in the market, because you have to pass through five to seven, eight years process in court. Really? So, wow. So there are situations where banks have this enormous portfolio of properties that they are not able to sell where whoever is in a property here now and then pays something so they're stuck in a situation where they don't want to put themselves the banks in a situation where the, the, whoever is paying the mortgage cannot pay anymore the mortgage at some point so the banks always tell the property's value is is obviously important for us but we want to be sure that you will be able to to pay back your your mortgage and how do you determine that your tax return from your home country is not considered a valid document because how do we determine if it's a real document? But even if it is and you are in the default, how can I recover my money if all your money are in a foreign country? There's no chance for an Italian bank to be able to recover the money passing through an international procedure of money recovery. So they want to be sure that the money that you are, um, the money that they need to recover, it's money that they can find in, in, in Italy, based on the statistics that if you're making money in Italy, it's more likely for them to recover your money. So m most expats then are coming here and buying cash, real estate in cash, including Correct. the Airbnb properties, because there's a lot of Airbnb properties here in Florence also. Very often, I haven't seen many properties. Per now, let's, cl let's clarify. The moment that an expat or a person who is living, coming from abroad, establish his personal presence. So he has a permesso di soggiorno, he's renewing permesso di soggiorno, he gets residency, so the permanent domicile in Italy. So you start having a history, you have a bank account where periodically the bank will start seeing that you have money coming in. You create also a relationship with the bank. So the banks can start trusting on, in your ability to pay back mm -hmm. the mortgage. Sometimes the first property that you buy is maybe you pay cash, but then the fact that that business is generating an income through the, the Airbnb by renting it out, that becomes a business that you have in Italy that can be considered sufficient for, for the bank to, to sponsor the following investment you're doing. So it's, it's, it's a situation where when you're arriving for the first time, you might have a problem. And if you're coming as a tourist, if you are part of the expat community who is living in Italy, who has uh, who's recognized as a credits with an Italian bank because again having done transaction with the bank even more if you have extra properties you already purchased obviously the more you are integrated let's say in a community the easier it will be for a bank to trust you and therefore yeah. to give you a mortgage but it's a relationship game in other words it's not often, anything yeah. like in the US in terms of just like a standard process of borrowing money to buy property okay so now let, let, you brought up a quite thing I want to discuss um, a lot of digital nomads now. This hmm. is like the new thing with people, since COVID really, realizing yep. we can work from anywhere. Like we're using my apartment today as a studio. I've done TV shows literally from this table on a laptop. I've done keynotes from here. Um, what is the digital nomad process in Italy? They've talked about one, but is, is there one yet? If you like, I think that digital nomad is one of the most researched terms in terms of Italian visa, like digital nomad visa um, for Italy. The digital nomad was announced with a, with a, um, 
let's say, an amendment to our immigration law, so it exists on the paper, a reference to um, people able to work remotely and they could be eligible for a highly qualified visa in respecting certain circumstances or certain requirements. The thing is that the law needed to be implemented by a regulation determining what are the requirements for these visa to be requested. And those implementing rules were never, have not yet, as we speak, Still not, in, not in, approved. in April 2024, 2023, we don't have yet those implementing rules. So on the paper, we have a visa that talks about digital monomad, but we are missing all the regulation and all the, uh, let's say, directions that are expected to be given to the consulates in order to apply this visa. So at the moment, the digital nomad visa is not a visa scheme that can be used. However, and this is what I say all to, to my clients, don't get discouraged, because it is true that the digital nomad visa should be a, a type of visa to be used to uh, speed up the process of getting a visa, but it's not the only way. If you're, if you're a digital nomad, in other terms, you're already an online consultant. You're already a person that offers certain kind of consultancy service, it can be a social media manager, can be a marketing strategist, can be a graphic designer, can be a life coach, a business coach. These are all activities that goes under the umbrella of freelance activities that are already regulated by a freelance visa that we've been using for the past 15 years to bring people in Italy. So all those who are coming or, or believe, they believe that can be digital nomads, even if we don't have a digital nomad visa, are already able to apply for a visa that can, we can help them to, to obtain to bring their digital or online business here in Italy. So how, talk up, so the, the freelance vid, uh, visa, mm -hmm. how hard is that to get? And, and what is the process then, because I know people have that here, what is the process once you have this freelance vid, visa? So walk through the two things, how hard is it to get? And then what happens once you're here with that type of visa? It, it's hard in the sense that there, are, there is a lot of documentation that need to be collected and you generally speaking, especially if you're still in your home country, need to be collected with the help of a legal proxy and it's one of the things that we do for our clients. It's hard because it's very much regulated so it's the amount of documentation is not just the one that you, you Google and you check on the website of an Italian consulate telling you four or five items, four or five documents. Each one of those documents requires weeks of work they need to be done in order to collect the certificates here in Italy. So it's very regulated and it's hard in that sense. Um, some people think it's hard to get a freelance visa because there are the quota. In other words, the Italian government every year determine, determines how many people can enter in Italy and bring their business in Italy and they provide a time frame. So between, let's say, March and December, sometimes it's a shorter time frame. So, and there's also numbers limitations. So you don't have more than five, 600 quotas every year for people who want to come here. These, these quotas are, some of those quotas are, are used for people already here in Italy, let's say as a student and then want mm -hmm. to start a business. In this case, we're talking about conversion from a student visa to a work visa. Okay. Those are very hard to get because again, is, is, we are talking about only a few hundred visas, so they finish very quickly. And it's an easier process under some circumstances because if you're not putting together the right document, you can always integrate the application and the immigration office here are more keen to help you if you're missing something. If you're coming from your home country, so if you're not in Italy, the 500 quotas are very hardly used because it's a, such a hard process. Really? So that I think that we're pretty good at that and in 15 years of activity so far, knocking wood, we never, never had a rejection. But when people come to us and say, oh, we are not applying for a freelance visa or for self-employment visa because we read online it's so hard to get because there are only 500 sp spots. So the problem is not the spots. It's not, we never had a problem having um, a, an application accepted in terms of a quota with the Italian consulate. The biggest problem is again putting like bringing a neat and complete application you were talking about the one that you used that we're talking about document like like so probably 20 30 documents even though on the italian it consulate likes their documents in, in, <laughs> the, for the the type of visa you applied for the documents are like in, enlisted in on the web consulate in the the website of the consulate are probably six seven documents so you think how long is it going to take to get them 
if you remember how yes. how big was the pile of document that we had to put together and that makes the difference between a successful and not successful application not that there are not enough quotas but the fact that is is a is a process where you need to have someone helping you to collect the document properly and that answers your first question then assuming as we believe and as we like to say not if but when you arrive in Italy what's the next step the next step is again within eight days you go to the post office you get the package the kit that you need to fill out with all the documents a copy of all the same document you use the first time um, you need to fill out these forms the forms will be mailed to the immigration office of the place where you decide to reside they will call you two three months later for fingerprints you will they review the document if everything is fine you get at the end of let's say six months period your permesso di soggiorno now you are a legal uh, foreigner by a person that now is legally living in Italy from does, that does point that have on to be renewed every year also from that uh, it needs to be the, the work visa needs to be renewed the first time after one year following years every two years okay and after five full years of complete of being here legally you can actually apply for your green card let's call it this way which is a permanent permit to stay which is a permit to stay where you don't have to rebring all the documents every two years it lasts for 10 years now and is that um, only if you're working no so so what is so like would we be applying for a green card after five years yes we would yes is a is I'm After learning something new. Okay, I didn't know that. <laughs> we are, you can apply for a carta di soggiorno for, per, the name is carta di soggiorno per lungo soggiornati. So it's a, a, it's a permit to stay for, uh, for people that have been here for long enough to obtain a, a card, a document that doesn't expire. It expires after 10 years. Okay. But you don't have any more to prove every time that you're making an income, that you're generating income, that you're complying with social security obligation. So it's a card that once you get it, you only have to reapply to extend it as it is for your driving license, in other words. All right, so now with all these processes, let's jump to the one that should excite some people who are listening to this, because you told me there's 20 million Americans <laughs> that have an Italian heritage that could possibly allow them to become an Italian citizen. And I've sent a bunch of people to you who have done this. Yes, um, we are many. And, and they've been successful. And, and so like, then you, walk us through that. How does someone <coughs> know, you know they, they know their family's from Italy. When, when are they a candidate for somebody who can actually get Italian citizenship? This is very interesting. Um, Italy is one of, I say sometimes during our meeting with our clients, one of the most generous, um, European Union country in terms of allowing people to recover Italian citizenship. I say recover because, uh, as you said, there are potentially millions and millions of Americans that even without knowing, come, uh, they are eligible to recover their Italian citizenship because they are grandparents, great-grandparents, they are great-great-great-grandparents who arrived from Italy at the end of the 18th century they are eligible to recover their Italian citizenship. If you consider that we had um, during the migration period and in between the beginning of 19, like 19, 1910, 1920, around three, four millions of Italians had just ar arrived in America. Literally off the boat. Off the boat in Ellis Island, in different parts of like New York, but in different places in the United States. Each one of these people had children when they were um, in America. And those children had children and grandchildren. So Italy doesn't stop because the, the Italian citizenship is passed through a principle that is the, the, the right of the blood, jure sanguinis. If, you receive, if your father was an Italian citizen when you were born, because he didn't renounce to his Italian citizenship, you obtain the same Italian blood. If you have a, a child in America, when you're in America, that child automatically will receive the same Italian blood. So as long as you're able to prove that the Italian-born member of a family who arrived in America at some point didn't relinquish to his Italian citizenship to become American before the birth of the next in line, so before the birth of a child that he had when he was in America, that, that blood was passed from the father to the child to the grandchildren to the great-grandchildren up to now. 
So if you multiply the four millions of Amer Italians that arrived at the beginning of the century to now, you can imagine how millions of potential Italians are outside there in the United States that just need to collect the documentation to prove that there is an uninterrupted chain of Italian blood starting from their great-grandfather who from, from Sicily arrived to New York. The great-grandfather Mario had a, a child that is a great-grandparent of the applicant who was born when the grandfa great-grandfather was still in, an Italian citizen. And then generation after generation because that first child born in America was born when the father was still an Italian citizen, that child was able to pass the Italian citizenship to the following generations. So I know people call you and some people are super organized and somehow their family has kept all this paperwork. Mm -hmm. But then other people call you and they don't have that paperwork. Nope. And you help them find, I guess, that paperwork. How, how yeah. do you find the lineage and the paperwork on this? It's very interesting. We are generally speaking on the Italian side of the application, meaning we go, we have incredible genealogists in our legal team that are able to find, we call them the 007 of the genealogy because they're really <laughs> able to dig into files in archives. It sometimes it looks like Harry Potter, these super dusty books. Keep in mind that we don't have yet a well-organized, digi digitized archives of, of a birth, um, marriage and death certificates of people born 150 years ago. Now, yes, everything is digitized, digitized but for some of these documents, we need to go in the city where the people were born and try to find the baptism certificate, the, the uh, like the the draft card for uh, the kids that get, had to go in in the war. So all these documents need to be found locally in the city where our client has to tell us that the Italian member of a family was born. Just Obviously, go, we we, can, and we we do our search. We get in touch with the authorities. We try to find that document that is a key document because in order for any application to be successful first of all we need to find the original documents <clears throat> from the battle record office of a city where those people were born in Italy and we're that's part of our job and so like we tried to do this actually with Alicia, mm -hmm. my wife, because Alicia is it comes from Italian descent mm -hmm. so you went through the process to find all the documents and then sadly, we found, I think, in her family at some point, someone relinquished Italian citizenship. They relinquished the Italian citizenship a few years before they, their child was born. So the grandfather, if I remember correctly, of Alicia was born in the United States. But when both the parents already renounced to their Italian citizenship. So when the baby was born, both the parents already we are just Americans because back at the time yeah. you couldn't keep two citizenship. To become American, you had to accept to renounce to your Italian citizenship. So, and if in the meantime, before com the completion of this process of becoming American, you had a baby, that baby was still ba born to Italian parents. If the baby was born when you already completed the process of becoming American, at that point, there is no more Italian blood in your vein. You're already an American citizen, and therefore you cannot pass Italian citizenship to, to the next in line. But that's part of our assessment. We help the, the other document together with the genealogy part of the act, uh, activity that we run that is very important is to determine when that moment, if it happened, of renouncing to your Italian citizenship took place in respect of the birth of the next generation. So the true, the, the first part of our activity that we called the investigation phase covers the collection of the Italian document and determining when the, when the, the, the acquisition of the American citizenship took place to determine whether the kid born in America were born before or after the naturalization. And I think some people don't understand what's the value of having another passport, another citizenship. And, and you know, the reason we wanted to do it is First of all, to have a second passport and have a citizenship, but it was for the kids, really, specifically for James, because then he is <clears throat> also getting Italian citizenship, and then he has the ability to have a passport and work in the EU. So there's, a, there's enormous advantages to, to doing this, and I just Absolutely. think that, again, you can hear it's really complicated to do this, but that's why people hire you to get, get, get help right. with this. Um, what have I not, you know, you, I asked you for some other questions and we've covered so much, but what have I not asked you that you think I should have asked you? 
There are a few things that I find interesting. Um, I told you some of the most misleading information that sometimes people ask us. What is, uh, if I'm in Italy, can I stay in Italy? Can I get my visa while I'm in Italy? I know that I need a visa, but can I get the visa while I'm in Italy? Can I apply for my visa here? I said, no, you need to go home to your home country and get the document. We can collect the document while you're here, but then you have to bring it to the Italian consulate. So thinking that you can apply for the visa you want to have while you're in Italy is not possible. The other thing is, if I buy a property in Italy, the, can I stay in Italy? Or the other thing is, I have a Codice Fiscale, which is a Codice oh, Fiscale. talk about that. Codice Fiscale is simply the equivalent of your, more or less, social security number. It's an identification number that is used in almost any economic transaction we have in Italy. So if you want to rent an apartment, if you want to put a deposit for buying a property, if you want to get a SIM card to put in your cell phone, you need to have a Codice Fiscale. So, but it, so it's very important, it's very useful information to have. Um, it's, having a Codice Fiscale doesn't mean that you're a taxpayer, it doesn't mean that you become subject to pay taxes in Italy. It's just a way to identify you as a subject that's going to interact into in a business transaction. And some people say, well, I got my Codice Fiscale, can I stay in Italy now? I said, no, no, no. Codice Fiscale doesn't have anything to do with your being legal in Italy. It's just a piece of information, a useful and handy piece of document that you might need, that you will probably need when you come, when you decide, if you decide to stay here longer. So my suggestion is always, if you're coming in Italy and you're not just a tourist, you're planning to do some investment, you definitely need, that goes from renting a place to buy a property, renting a car, you very likely will need a Codice Fiscale. So try you, you to apply immediately. You can't do anything without the Codice. I mean, the funny thing is I remember being in the bank and we're filling out the forms and they say, okay, we need your Codice Fiscale. Fiscale. And I was like, uh, Michele, help. <laughs> like you literally ran off and got it for us. Yeah. Um, but we've needed it for everything. Everything we've done, rent uh -huh. a car. I even think join a gym, go to anything healthcare related. Healthcare. Yeah. The healthcare is another big thing. Um, there are a couple of things that I think are very important and not to confuse each other. I said that when you get the permit to stay, you are legal. You are legal in Italy means that you comply with the immigration part of your, your coming to Italy. A lot of people don't understand that the next thing that they should do is to register with a municipality, with a city where they are living, to become a permanent resident. Becoming a permanent resident means that from a, from a daily point of view for the things that you need to do, having a residenza, a permanent domicile, allows you to join voluntarily on a voluntary basis the healthcare system. You cannot have access to the healthcare system with the incredible advantage that our healthcare system can provide in terms of a very general healthcare system if you don't have a residenza. If you don't have a residenza, so if you do become a permanent resident, you, are, you don't qualify for the uh, long-term visa permit to say that was telling you, the one that you can apply after five years. You need to be a resident. If you stay in Italy for 10 years, even if you don't have an Italian legacy, so if you don't have Italian blood, for after 10 years of permanent residency, starting from when you become resident, you can obtain Italian citizenship. So you can obtain Italian citizenship even if you don't have Italian blood in your vein, but because you resided um, for, for 10 years. If you are here, if you want to buy a car or if you want to get an it Italian driving license, which is another big subject, you cannot drive forever with your international driving license from America. After one year of a residency, you are expected to get your Italian driving license, but you cannot get a driving license if you don't get a, a residenza. Can so, you see, by the way, all my friends, why you actually need to have the Italian whisper here in your back pocket? Because I, I just, you know, we feel so lucky that we found you, but I think anybody who comes to Italy, and especially Florence, if they need help, you're, you're the person to get help from. So I'm glad we could, we could yeah. like, put you in front of everyone today. You've got a book here, uh, Legal Advice for Expats in Italy. How do people get a copy of your book? Online, on Amazon, it's still available, and we're still, well, we're actually working on a few extra projects that would be very interesting at some point to, to talk about. Well, Let's first of all, we have, we have our podcast that is going to be an updated version of, of some of the things we cover in the book, and that basically covers everything you need to know in order to move your life, family, and business in Italy in a, in, 
uh, how do you say it, in a smooth way, like without too much, like avoiding some of the biggest mistakes and misconceptions you can L find. Live, living the Italian dream without the nightmare. <laughs> That's a way, good way, like, can, can I take it? It was very... <laughs> you, you, you can take <laughs> it. And, and it was very nice. Your, the name of the podcast is, is uh, The Italian Legal Whisperer, so they'll be able to get that where all podcasts are. You know, they're on, it's on all the platforms, um, obviously on our website. Um, yeah, tell, me, like tell them how to find your website. It is very easy. It's uh, www.capecchilegal.com. So it's Capecchi, my last name, Capecchi Legal. Maybe, maybe spell it for those who don't know how to spell C A C A P E C C H I legal.com. Okay. All one, one, one word. And from there, you're going to find the, the podcast part where you can find all the podcasts and all the articles that we've been writing with the Florentine and together on, with the Florentine for more than a decades now. We've been working and having great collaborations for, for many years with the Florentine. They do such great work. And, you know, so last weekend, I guess we'll end with birthday story here. Last weekend was Michele's birthday. <laughs> we had yeah. his wife, Elia, <laughs> uh, threw a surprise birthday party for him. The surprise birthday involved uh, the most amazing experience. We did a, bl a balloon ride almost from out front my door here, a balloon mm. that took off on the Arno over Florence. Um, it was truly, if you come to Florence, one of the most spectacular experiences I think you can have in Florence, and very few people do, is, take a, is to take a balloon uh, ride yeah. over Florence. And you had, you've lived your, most of your life and you had never done it before. We were in a basket together going up, and then I found out that you were actually afraid of heights. <laughs> <laughs> and I, as I said to to you guys when we were having lunch together after that experience, if it wasn't for you guys, I would have never done it. Like, I... Uh, it's actually I, super brave of you. I felt I, bad. You're like, I look at you, I'm like, Michael, are you all right? And you were like, yeah, I, I'm okay. I tell my wife, Elle, <laughs> Elle, if you were here, just the two of us doing this, I would have told us that, let's go back home. I'm not going to do it. But there were so many of you guys. It was a group of 10 friends, some, some of my best friends in Florence. And, you know, I felt like, well, I'm here with them. I, can, I cannot pass this, like I have to do it. So it I forced really, myself to do it, it was a great experience. It was really special. And one of the coolest things I think, like a lifetime memory, is we actually flew over your home in Tuscany, yep. called your kids, <laughs> the kids came out on the balcony, looked up and they could see us and we could see them. I mean, yeah. how often is, you know, does that get to happen? Well, it's a great thing about Florence. You know, Florence is, again, is, it's a tiny village because it's not that big. We're talking about 300,000 resident, permanent residents, but then it's one of the biggest cities in terms of the community and where you, you can have incredible experience here. One of the incredible experiences is that you can take off with a hot air balloon from the center of Florence, from the river, and you, you see this beautiful Renaissance town has been so well preserved over centuries, still seeing the like Boboli Garden and Cascina Garden, Palazzo Pitti, the, the most beautiful thing from a perspective you've never seen before. And then two minutes later, <laughs> you're already in the countryside because <laughs> that's the other great thing. You can re literally live from Florence. You are in five minutes, 10 minutes, you are in the middle of the Chianti countryside. In a little more than 40 minutes, you're on the coast, on the beautiful coast we have. So it's very, even from a logistic point of view, being in Florence is an incredible opportunity for a lot of people to explore, even from up high on the sky, uh, our, our territory. Well, I tell you all the time how much I appreciate you. I, one of the things I'd say to Michele when I'm with him is that um, you made Florence feel like home immediately. That's and a I, great compliment. I, Thank I just, you. Um, I love you. I appreciate you so much. You and Ellie have been such dear friends to us. You've helped so many of our friends. And so it's just great to be able to do this today. I'm excited for your new podcast. I think it's going to be a huge hit. And, we hope so. You know, I know you're busier than ever, but I hope for anybody who needs to get help, they'll be able to find you. And thanks for all this free advice, because I think you just basically gave people um, a lot of knowledge here. This is just the, the top of the iceberg, as we yeah. say. Like, it's great being able to share some of these generic and like principles that can help them to start navigating. It's very important for people to understand that none of the things that you can find online, not even this, can be taken as legal advice in the sense that every case is different. They need to get in touch with professional people because outside there, there are information that maybe work for one person, but doesn't work in your case. And we've seen so many people making the mistakes of relying on social media's information or a friend of a friend, a cousin doing some things and obtaining what that person wanted. And they think that automatically applies to them. 
that's not the case. Even what we discussed today is a great uh, food for thought, in my opinion, but then we need to go of course. further and on our way together. That's why they need the Italian whisper. <laughs> Thank you so much, David. Listen, Michele, it's great to have you. Everybody, you've been listening to the David Bach Show. You'll see this also on Bach Talk uh, with Florentine. And thank you. If you've enjoyed this, please let us know. Post a comment. Hit that like button. Let me know if you want me to do more podcasts. And I uh, really appreciate you all being here. Michele, awesome job. Great being here with you. Good to see you. Thanks, everybody.